uh, very successful uh, sessions in this particular thing. And today I have the uh, uh, privilege of hosting Professor uh, T. Pradeep uh, Padma Shri, uh, Institute Professor and Professor of Chemistry at IIT Madras. Yeah. And, and, and he'll be uh, speaking on, may I request everybody else to uh, stay on mute, please? Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, 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 Professor T. Pradeep Padmashri, Institute Professor and Professor of Chemistry at IIT Madras, and uh, he'll be speaking on affordable clean water with advanced materials. Uh, before I, I will, you know, introduce uh, him properly, a few words about the Alumni Center uh, uh, Chennai and the, uh, uh, the webinar series. Most of you are familiar with it, but uh, we started the webinar series, uh, you know, in July of uh, last year, 2021. And uh, most of the initial sessions have been online. And, uh, and then we have moved uh, in between the second and the third wave of the pandemic. We moved to uh, some mixed online and physical sessions at, the, uh, at our new home in IIT Madras Research Park. Uh, and the, uh, the streams, as I said, we have, of course, the faculty researcher of the month. Uh, we've had many distinguished faculty uh, in this uh, uh, session. Uh, so Professor Krishan Bala Subramaniam of IIT Madras uh, had kicked it off. We had Professor Manindra Agarwal of IIT Kanpur, uh, Professor Arvind Chandran again from IIT Madras, uh, and, and most recently, Professor Ravindran uh, from Computer Science IIT Madras uh, spoke on, is AI ready for the real world? Uh, Voices of Excellence, uh, which have had uh, very distinguished uh, speakers. We've had uh, director, former director now, Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy, uh, Professor Ashok Junjunwala, President of Research Park. We've had Chris Gopalakrishnan, our uh, distinguished alumnus of IIT Madras, and uh, former uh, CEO of Infosys, and of course, uh, patron member yeah. of our own uh, club. And uh, Mr. N. Lakshmi Narayanan, former CEO of Cognizant, and also a member of our club. So Voices of Excellence uh, has had some uh, really star speakers. And then we have had many startups uh, from um, uh, both the IIT uh, Madras uh, ecosystem and of course the IIT Madras Research Park. Uh, uh, we've had a student team as well. Team Hyperloop was uh, interviewed uh, about a month ago uh, on this very exciting project that they're doing uh, uh, in, in, in not just inventing, but also winning accolades for the Hyperloop um, uh, project that they are working on um, since they, they qualified for the Hyperloop event in uh, California two, three years ago. And, and there have been a lot of uh, mixed bag sessions. Uh, Vijay Kamalakara, CEO of Story Trails, uh, had talked about unexpected tales behind Indian monuments. Um, Bibliotech, of course, is very regular. We've had many uh, you know, good book reading and storytelling sessions. Musicians, have uh, loved the iTunes session. Uh, we've had many uh, uh, things, including Three Brothers and a Violin, uh, the musical journey of Lakshmi Khan Pyarelal. We've had two quizzes, uh, first hosted by Meenakshi Ramesh, second by Professor Ashwin Mahalingam. And I promised to do the third one. Uh, we were, I'm hoping that we will be able to do it physically like, like the one we did with Professor Ashok, uh, Ashwin uh, uh, in between the two waves. Um, so either it will be uh, a couple of weeks from now or in early March, we'll just figure that out. Um, and uh, we've had uh, a Bangladesh war veteran, Colonel Krishnaswamy, who happens to be my father, also interviewed uh, just a few days ago. So that's what the, uh, the webinar series is about. And again, thank you all for uh, participating in it and uh, uh, sharing your, your time on this uh, very interesting topic. Uh, so let me now formally introduce uh, uh, Professor Talapil Pradeep. Um, as I said, he's a uh, institute professor and professor of chemistry, Padma Shri. Uh, he is the Deepak Parekh chair professor as well. Um, and uh, in uh, in uh, my own personal experience, when I visited uh, his lab uh, uh, several times over the last uh, uh, nearly now a decade. Uh, I think uh, the, the first thing I'd like to say is that if you have the time and uh, you have the interest, I would really recommend that uh, you go visit the lab. It's a real fantastic experience. Uh, it's not just deep science which is happening there, but very practical and scaled engineering. I'm sure he'll talk about that. Uh, and today, I'm sure he will spend time on his um, on his uh, you know, pet topic, which is to really get into the materials the chemistry, the, the molecular and nanoscale uh, capabilities uh, required for uh, you know, his life's mission, which is uh, uh, 
to to ensure pure drinking water and he is not a you know uh, just a, a wonderful uh, researcher and a wonderful teacher but his uh, work has reached millions of people uh, just this pesticide removal technology has probably reached uh, 10 million people uh, of course, he's won enormous number of awards, uh, Shanti Suru Bhatnagar Award, the Bhim Birla Science Prize, Padma Shri have already talked about, the Nikkei Asia Prize, and many, many other uh, things. We're really privileged, sir, to have you with us. And over to you now for your session on affordable clean water with advanced medicals. Thank you. It's always a pleasure uh, to talk uh, to our alumni and well wishers. Thank you. Anand uh, for anchoring this. I, I know that uh, he studied physics uh, early uh, in his life and then and moved uh, to computer science. And so obviously this particular subject matter uh, is somewhat uh, connected to uh, his area of uh, study in materials. So let me share um, a screen with you. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, water uh, itself is a material. Uh, and the science of water is becoming increasingly fascinating in the recent past. For example, last year, 2021, we created, not we, uh, the scientific community created metallic water. Uh, Last year, the scientific community created plastic ice. So this subject matter of water and the material science of it is so fascinating. And the pioneers of uh, materials, uh, chemistry, physics, uh, biology, let, such as uh, Linus Pauling, uh, they were all fascinated by this molecule. Uh, Linus Pauling was instrumental, by the way, he sort of, he wrote this classic book of chemistry, The Nature of the Chemical Bond, uh, which was the most celebrated as the most influential book of the last century. Uh, so th this is something very interesting uh, that's, that science uh, has fascinated uh, the attention of a lot of people. Now, how this molecule contains all of these in wealth of properties is something still we don't really know. And therefore in our laboratory, we pursue uh, water in great detail from a fundamental perspective, ice in a fundamental perspective. Uh, but I also look at water, uh, clean water, as Anand said, uh, using materials. That's the story that I wish to talk about today uh, and not necessarily the other aspects of water uh, wherein you know we have built many interesting, uh, fascinating instruments and facilities uh, with both microscopy and spectroscopy. This talk is also going to be uh, largely translation, translational in nature. So I will focus on that kind of science and not necessarily getting into the molecular chemistry which enables this process uh, in finer detail. But I will sort of brief, briefly browse through that. At the outset, I must say that our dreams become reality with materials. And this has been a civilization saga uh, of dreams becoming reality with materials. Uh, look at this book. This book was written in 19... 65 by Jules Verne, from the earth to the moon. Uh, and he talks about the journey. One day they made a decision uh, at Baltimore, this group of people, uh, that uh, they would put all their power of explosives to send a vehicle to moon. The vehicle to moon became a reality with advanced materials. Not only the explosives and many others, but this happened with 
the vehicle that was constructed out of aluminum. And you know, this was 1865. Aluminum started its industrial production in a large scale only in 1878. It was produced in limited quantities only in 1856. It was discovered only in 1825. Advanced materials, at that time, aluminum was more expensive than gold, as, uh, as you would know. So this is the story of materials. Of course, aluminum became a, a made this dream of sending uh, a vehicle to moon a reality because of its property, uh, properties. But most importantly, uh, its strength at low weight. Uh, its mass was very small. Of course, they, they did this story, and if you are interested in reading, please look at this, how men dreamt about something using materials. Coming to water, uh, while material science is all fascinating about water, the single most important thing is that our economic, social, and cultural outcomes our civilization can all be traced to water in one way or the other. I normally say that everything simplifies to water. There is a water cost in everything, including the stock that we are talking about. Uh, and we will not venture further into, into that. In the context of water, that water is not available for everybody. And that is this I didn't know this, I didn't know this uh, great, all these uh, truth, truths, so to say, about water. Uh, I got into this uh, much later, some 22 years ago. Uh, and then since then, I have been looking at water related technologies. So there are many, many technologies that people have developed to make water clean. And all these are are today industrially used in, in big ways. We got into clean water technologies uh, somewhere around 2002 or so. My first patent uh, on this was in 2005, and that is what was commercialized as Anand said. Um, since then, many different technologies. And I have always been saying that affordable clean water is a problem of advanced materials. On the surface of water, we have clean water because we have advanced materials on the surface. If, if you look at the surface of earth, we have silica, we have alumina, we have many minerals, they don't dissolve in water. Their solubility product is so low. As a result, water is clean, Everything that could dissolve ended up in the ocean. But then, this is how nature was, but everything that we produced, all of them have a high solubility product and everything gets into water. The only way that we know how to run civilizations is to run our waste through with water. So there are many aspects which make water unclean. Uh, and most importantly, uh, that is to do with the human activity. We have produced a large number of materials to solve this. Advanced materials, most recently nanomaterials. And the subject area of using nanomaterials for clean water is called aqua nanotechnology and we have written about it. Uh, using this, this kind of technologies. We have new materials, new sensors, new catalysts, several new phenomena. A large number of devices have come. But one thing that is very important is to know is that nanomaterials have become atomically precise. So here is a particle of a nanoparticle. It contains precisely a certain number of atoms. This contains 25 atoms of a metal. But 25 atom metal particle, precisely 25, not 24 or 26. 
with a specific shape. And that has a molecular weight. That has a property that a spectroscopy, that has crystal structure, many different things. This has become possible because of a large number of advanced analytical tools. What you're seeing is a mass spectrum of such a particle, precisely certain mass, precisely. And that precision is all engineering, so to say, molecular engineering, you say. It creates such structures. What does this allow you? This allows you to study the interaction of matter, uh, interaction of this kind of matter uh, with contaminants in water or molecules in biology, many different uh, kind of science one can do. I decided to study interactions of these materials with contaminants in water. With diverse tools of uh, spectroscopy, 2002, at that time, this kind of, these tools are not available. Uh, many of them we built our own, uh, many of them were purchased. But those days, you could study these largely with spectroscopy. And what's the outcome of this? This is one such outcome. It is not easy to relate to this, uh, Anand was saying that um, I do both, is not so easy to relate that basic science to products like this. What we saw uh, was that several nanomaterials we produce uh, could remove arsenic from drinking water. And that was studied in great detail with spectroscopy to understand these properties, how they originate, how these properties originate. And we will get to that in one or two slides later on. Now, what this allowed us was that in a region like West Bengal, where in this district of Nadia, uh, where water, if it's drawn from a depth of about 60 to 80 feet, you have a possibility of arsenic in water. And that arsenic concentration can be eight to about 18 times higher than the prescribed limits. The prescribed limit is 10 micrograms per liter. And what is present is about 60 micrograms per liter to 180 micrograms per liter. In this region, it can be even up to 1,000 micrograms in several parts. This also comes out, uh, water comes out also with iron, a little bit of iron. And if you leave it untreated on a, the cement platform, uh, the platform becomes red in color. That's because of iron oxide. And in this region, you know, if there is iron oxide present, there is a possibility that arsenic is also present. People knew this for a long time. Historically, we know this arsenic contamination in water for the past 108 years. Uh, that was the first record in India about 50 years or so. But we did not have affordable solutions. This boy is pumping water from that depth. One stroke of this pump produces 300 ml of water with uh, no additional pressure drop and no delay. Uh, that water becomes clean. And that clean water conforms to US EPA standards. Now you can produce about 1000 liters of water per day. And this is useful for a small school. And it produces clean water. This material that is charged in this, about seven kilograms of these nanomaterials charged in this filter, uh, along with many other materials. That is why this is a little bit uh, higher in uh, you know, this height. The water that comes out, uh, is clean, as I said, you can get about 1,000 liters of water uh, per day. And this unit runs at that concentration for about two and a half years without removing, uh, without changing any medium in this. There is no electricity, directly this water comes out. Great. Now what happens when water, uh, arsenic containing water is filtered out, you have arsenic in this material. How do you dump it? In this kind of materials, we found that they don't release arsenic even after their useful life beyond a fixed concentration. So if this soil contains certain amount of arsenic, the re leach rate is below the concentration in this water region. So therefore, 
the material can go back to field. So what's the cost of it? We said affordable water. At that point in time, I set a price of five paisa per liter uh, for drinking water, conforming to all standards, including all the costs put together. Today, we are in a position to supply arsenic and iron and other uh, contaminant-free water at 2.67 paisa per liter. And this is a small unit. We run units up to 1 million liters a day. So it is scalable, uh, it is affordable, it is also sustainable because the material that is produced, uh, the, their entire production is in water and uh, they don't use electricity, they don't use organic solvents. So you do a sustainability assessment of it, uh, you find that the material conforms to all the standards. So this is how the advanced material science has got translated. The basis of this is materials, as I said. Uh, what we did, this is a paper, it is in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences of the United States. This is what we showed such materials can be made. We call these materials as water positive materials. One liter of water used for the synthesis of these materials should produce at least 10 to the power two to 10 to the power three uh, times clean water. How is it for real materials today? Well, you make materials using water, of course you clean water using such materials. And after the cleaning, whatever the cycle, it goes back to the environment and it contaminates the environment the production and the subsequent uh, release of these materials in the environment, they consume water. If you do a net water balance, you find that many of these materials are not water positive. So what's the basis of it? We take biopolymers, there are a number of biopolymers that one can use, uh, including cellulose, or uh, chitosan, several biopolymers. On these biopolymers, uh, we crystallize aluminum oxyhydroxide in the form of nanoscale flakes. And these nanoscale flakes on these, uh, kindly mute your microphones, uh, on these um, biopolymer templates, when you crystallize such materials, it is possible to create nanoscale cavities. In these cavities, you can trap nanoparticles and you can design such nanoparticles in cavities. What you see is a schematic representation of aluminum oxyhydroxide using a template of a polymer. You create a two dimensional uh, structure here. Really speaking, they are three dimensional and the three-dimensional such structures which look like boxes. So this particular thing is a sheet of about 50, micro, 50 nanometers long, 15 nanometers wide, and 50, uh, nano, 15 nanometers in depth. 15 nanometers in depth and 50 nanometers in width. Such kind of uh, a box uh, you can create. And in these boxes, you can put uh, nanoparticles uh, this entire material, although is made in water at room temperature, they finally become a sand-like composite over which you can keep water for years together. This entire process is very similar to biological synthesis, just as seashells are made in water uh, using calcium carbonate or calcium ions, carbonate ions and others over a biopolymer template, over a long period, the similar process, you can do it over a few hours. And that's the whole idea of creating such materials. Now, why are we creating such materials? In this particular specific case, these materials uh, release, the particles are silver nanoparticles. They release silver ions in water at a definite concentration. And this concentration does not go down. Normally, if you create silver nanoparticle, they do produce silver ions, but these silver ions concentration go down in water 
real water, especially water containing all the contaminants, the concentration goes down in about a few days. As a result, there is no antibacterial activity this material uh, can have. And this activity comes down. Now, in this particular case, you see a release similar to a drug-like release in, uh, from this material. And you study this. So this is how a laboratory got transformed. Typically, a laboratory will study all of these properties with one liter of water. But we study with 10,000 liter of water. So obviously, laboratory becomes a new place. It is uh, lab come uh, sort of, I would say, manufacturing. So this is what IIT Madras ecosystem has allowed us uh, to do. Uh, now, in this kind of water, where there is a definite concentration of silver ions, bacteria which are alive, they die. OK. Now you ask this question, such particles are there, is there nanotoxicity? When nanoparticles are deliberately put into bacteria, they pick up nanoparticles, get into bacteria, you can do spectroscopy to characterize it. But in our case, ions are getting into this bacteria and they, get, uh, they act on the bacterial uh, cells the membrane gets damaged. And as a result, you have lysis that is happening. You can do spectroscopy to see this, but you don't have any nanotoxicity because of nanoparticles. Now, that was one material. You can have a large number of similar materials. One such material is iron oxyhydroxide. I do not have time or uh, you know, the kind of uh, background information with all of you to tell you everything about this, but these are small particles. So these particles absorb uh, arsenic ions uh, on, on their surface. We study these with, uh, these are a number of spectroscopic uh, uh, data or spectral data. These data tell you that both arsenate ion and arsenite ion, these are the two ions present in water, they get effectively removed. Now a nanoparticle of this kind can be modeled with such data. So we understand where arsenate and arsenite go in on the surface. And by studying such things, we can calculate a theoretical adsorption capacity. You can then, of course, produce better and better materials. Some and substance of this is that such materials can be put into a cartridge and a certain concentration of ions can be sent through these arsenic ions. And what you get out is this. And about uh, 20, 25 grams of this material can produce about 1,000 liters of clean water. And that is how you build plants. So from a traditional plant, which is working on this large, about 40 cents of uh, land area, supplying water to about uh, 1,500 people, you can shrink this entire uh, land area uh, to less than 3 cents of land because this material capacity has increased tremendously the filter beds are way different. Uh, and, and today, such plants are being, this was our first plant of that kind of capacity, about 200,000 liters uh, a day. Uh, now, this is all going in different uh, places. And there are very, many such uh, treatment plants. So this is one such uh, kind of uh, a, a setup that is there. Uh, at 2.1 paisa per liter, that is what uh, that we have now. Today, these sensors, uh, these filter media are used to produce plants which are fitted with sensors of water quality analysis. So the entire pipeline, uh, we have sensors. For the plant, we have sensors. At home, we have sensors. This is very similar to the kind of gel jeevan mission uh, model that is being practiced. I have a short movie uh, to tell you what is going on. So that's a background village to which water is supplied from this plant.
so that activity today, it, it may be arsenic free Punjab or arsenic free West Bengal or arsenic free country. Uh, so this activity is going on today. These plants are being monitored uh, remotely. As of now, they are also controlled remotely with uh, valves and such control systems. Now, this is possible. When <laughs> Possible when water is kindly muted. This is possible when water is available. In case water is not there, what do you do? And so what we have done in this particular case is uh, atmospheric water harvesting. What you see is uh, a, a chemical synthesis using droplets, micro droplets. These are micros, micron scale droplets. And such droplets can be used to create nanostructures uh, like these. These nanostructures are very similar to grass and over which you can condense humidity when water, when the temperature is below the dew point. And using this, uh, we can create surfaces over which water can be condensed if the surface is cooled. And we have a startup company uh, which is called YUGEL. And so today it produces uh, uh, devices such as these we produce 25 liters uh, water a day to 2000 liters of water uh, a day and several people have written about this. Um, now globally uh, what is happening is that this active way of cooling with electricity people would like to do this uh, without uh, power with uh, non-conventional energy. Sustainable uh, processes of the, are being uh, investigated. The basis of this is again advanced materials. So such materials will harvest humidity during nighttime and with sunlight these get warmed up and the materials release water in a closed enclosure wherein humidity increases and water condenses and that water is collected. So there are several kinds of materials of this kind. They are not yet, uh, well, at an affordable cost today. So that's also an advanced materials challenge. Another subject area is a methodology by which RO can be replaced. This is called capacity desalination, wherein you have two electrodes, one is charged with positive charge, another is charged with negative charge. Saline water passes through and ions are removed. And when these materials, which are advanced materials, these materials get saturated, the electroadsorption capacity reaches uh, the limit. Polarity can be reversed and the ions adsorbed can go back to this water and that becomes the reject water. And you can run this device with the reject and uh, production cycles, uh, you get clean water. The amount of reject is about 18% uh, in comparison to 55 to 60% in RO. This is a prototype, but today we have uh, a, a manufacturing place, we have devices. Now these devices are very useful, especially in coastal areas where there is seawater intrusion and the salinity is about 3,000, 4,000 ppm. And this technology is very effective and it requires only reduced electricity. And the whole electrode uh, structure works at um, five volts and therefore one can run with solar. And such uh, water kiosks are now being installed uh, by this organization. The key to the success of such things, again, is advanced materials which constitute these electrodes. And there's a lot of engineering that goes on, chemistry that goes on uh, into this. We work on these uh, kinds of materials and their, their improved capacities uh, in the laboratory. At the same time, world over, advanced materials are evolving to 2D materials. So these are single sheet uh, materials similar to graphene. These are molybdenum sulfide nano sheets. What we can do is uh, we can produce small holes, holes as small as uh, three, four nanometers. And through this water can be passed through. So here is such a membrane with small holes 
poles less than about two nanometers, and these holes are ex the image, you know, the surface is uh, expanded or imaged better. And in these high resolution images uh, on this molybdenum sulfide sheet, you see these holes are composed of molybdenum to a large extent, sulfur is not present. Such molybdenum rich sheets, when you irradiate with sunlight in presence of water, you produce hydrogen peroxide and they destroy bacteria and the bacteria get killed, viruses get killed, and you can create clean water with the bacterial content of this passing through such a device, bacterial content goes down. So there is a whole lot of science that goes on in the group uh, wherein the diverse materials, whether they are, let us say, adsorbents uh, or uh, this kind of active materials, as I told you, to produce water from, from air or desalination, several things are going on. I will leave the subject uh, matter aside, but to say that such a science uh, can also be used for sensing. Today, uh, water quality sensors can be made in the laboratory um, with electrochemical, uh, electrochemistry. And this is from the work of another group where uh, electrochemical sensors have been developed for metal ions and various other contaminants in water, a handheld sensor, and the data comes on a mobile phone. Electrochemistry allows you to study a range of sensors. Uh, electrochemical sensors are available for over 160 contaminants in water. We don't have such sensors uh, today uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of a handheld fashion, but many important uh, contaminants can be studied uh, with such sensors. Ultimately, these sensors are becoming extremely small. For example, sensors like the spectrometers, these are spectrometers as small as this, they can be put on mobile phone and possibly water quality can be analyzed that of course changes the spectrometers which are as big to something as small as this that uh, produces big data and that big data uh, takes you to hydroinformatics uh, and everybody contributes to that data uh, right from the morning to evening not only quality quantity and several others which can influence policy and ultimately and water is available for all. So with this vision, we have built the International Center for Clean Water at IIT Madras, um, that is in the second floor of, uh, of the IIT Madras Research Park in the B Block. This is where ICCW is located. My research at IIT Madras is supported by a large number of students, and some of them have built companies and one such technology is called Amrit. Uh, this is anion and metal removal by Indian technology. This Amrit uh, has, has uh, today uh, installed arsenic-free filters, which are supplying arsenic-free water to 1.3 million people. Uh, and in that process, several people have helped us, especially our great institution, Bhaskar and uh, now Kamagodi. Thank you very much. If you have questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you so much, sir. I will uh, I'll really appreciate your, your superb work and also the exciting journey that you took us through from aluminum and Jules Verne all the way to uh, something closer to my world, which is uh, uh, water informatics and IoT and sensors and big data and so on. Uh, I just had two uh, initial uh, questions and uh, then I'll open the floor. I request uh, all uh, attendees to uh, uh, put up your hand on the uh, uh, on, 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 on the Zoom or uh, you know just type it into the question box. I will pick up. There's already one question in the uh, chat, so I'll pick up that uh, after I've done with the first two. Uh, either way is fine. So uh, uh, the question that comes to mind is that the a uh, fact that nanomaterial based zero energy water filtering is possible at lab scale 
was done by many people in the 80s, 90s. I know from personal experience in TCS research that uh, Dr. P.C. Kapoor had pioneered rice husk ash based water filtration in the, I think, the 80s and into the 90s. And we even commercialized it with Tata Chemicals, which became the famous Tata Swatch. What was the breakthrough which happened in this decade, which has really sort of taken this, this technology to where it is today, where millions are actually benefiting from it? Because technology was known for, I guess, you know, at lab scale for 20 years or more. But what, what was the actual sort of uh, breakthrough trigger which uh, brought it to this scale and this impressive outcome? Well, uh, I suppose in the initial period of uh, uh, Tata Switch and uh, related efforts globally, uh, they were all antimicrobial solutions. And several antimicrobial solutions were there. They had their limitations, but people have overcome them uh, over the past several years. Uh, now, that is one kind of need that water uh, community uh, wanted, for which there are other solutions like uh, chlorine or uh, many other disinfectant solutions like ozone and uh, things like that. The materials became attractive because one was cost, another was they could be handy converted into forms useful for domestic or any such kind of devices. The problem, however, was that they could not handle large concentrations of uh, bacteria or viruses or the varying viruses, varying bacteria coming into water. Of course, they all could be addressed with better and better materials. Materials are changing in that course. Uh, so this is what uh, happened in that uh, kind of science. Now, what I, I did was that, of course, we were working in that area and realized that there is no big challenge there that cannot be addressed by chlorine or chlorine related things or ozone or something. Several active chlorine release materials came, better technologies came. Earlier, chlorine was dropped as a gas or a liquid or something. It was difficult to handle only in community plants. It could be done. But subsequently, everything became smaller in domestic uh, purifiers. It could be done, handleable. So I further, I did not work on that further. I started focusing on areas wherein solutions were not there or not really affordable. The problem of arsenic came to our attention. The problem of fluoride, problem of uranium, problem of mercury, all of these started coming. So at that point in time, uh, the problem was that arsenic could be addressed with these materials, but arsenic had two species in water. You had to address both the species with the same effectiveness and the only way to address that, that effectively was with nanomaterials. And there our intervention came in, in the form of these new materials, wherein we were stabilizing a metastable phase of iron oxide that was not possible to be stabilized in nanoform. Thereby we had increased capacity though. So to answer you, what was that intervention that made it possible was a looking at that challenge which could be addressed with a material addressing that material science challenge uh, with the right material was that that single most important intervention very, very interesting. So, so don't follow the beaten path of antimicrobials, but look for a property uh, or a problem, in this case, arsenic and suspended heavy metals, uh, which can be addressed with material. And then that really has pioneered this excellent uh, overview. So just to extend that, yeah. uh, in the heavy metals area, um, 
there are industrial waste problems of very large scale, which uh, every mining industry faces. So tailing ponds of various kinds and in you know, iron ore uh, slimes in, in steel making uh, and so on. And these are not just environmental hazards, but now are economic burdens on these companies because they are being held responsible under the Anti-Pollution Act and all that to clean up the, the waste that they create. And, uh, you know, in any uh, of these mining uh, areas and especially closer to the larger ones, you know, these so-called slime lakes are there. I mean, they're all highly poisonous water because of the high, high concentration of uh, minerals that they don't want. Uh, would that be a worthy challenge for such next generation materials to not supply drinking water, but to solve a sustainability challenge? Great question. Um... You know, uh, it's a mixed uh, kind of uh, offerings that we have. Uh, there are several metals we, we can address very well with nanostructures. One is iron. Uh, and India, about 30% of the water contains iron in some way, especially in northeastern states. Concentrations very high. And a lot of industrial waste contains iron of that kind. And that is why iron is simply, we don't have affordable solutions, therefore iron is simply discharged. Today, this is addressable. That is because ions, iron's chemistry in water makes iron with a little bit of oxygen, it makes about 200 nanometer particles. So the question is, can you put enough oxygen in a reasonable time and can you remove 200 nanometer particle with materials? Yes, today it is possible. So therefore, this is addressable. The materials, iron's chemistry allows the iron problem to be handled with materials. However, for another ion, take for example, chromium, if it were to be, a, in that kind of concentration, at such a large concentration, material cannot, materials cannot address this today. That is because chromium chemistry is such that it always keeps itself in water. Now, so that is why I said it's a mixed kind of a thing. So how do you address this? Now, one way to address this is to have a mixed technology. Uh, you have materials technology along with membranes technology. We are, to date, this is possible. Using such combinations, uh, it is possible to address them. And now, there are a number of other challenges. Today, materials are not in a position to effectively address. Nitrate is one of them. We cannot address this very well. Uh, we cannot address fluoride very well. Well, we can address, but not at a million liters or 10 million liters, we cannot use, um, we cannot have such a plant running only on materials, affordable. So I will take this offline with you, sir. This is a worthy topic in itself and it just popped into my mind. This is the beauty of these sessions that uh, you know, and lateral, lateral thinking ideas can come in. Um, Tata Steel is setting up shop in the IIT Madras Research Park. And uh, uh, their uh, vice president for new materials, Devashish uh, is, is a very old friend of mine. I will bring him to you. This tailing and, and slimes problem for Tata Steel alone, the economics might make it worthy for us to actually find and characterize the right materials and the mix of, I like your thought of materials and membranes, perhaps in some different combination, because they have a millions of liters problem a day. <laughs> so, so I'll, anyway, so now let me go to the uh, the questions from our uh, uh, more than thirty plus participants. So I'm taking it in the order in which it's appearing in the chat. So Lordu Xavier has a question on toxicity depends on the dose, as Paracelsus said. Even if nanoparticles are not released and it's only released silver ions that kill bacteria, I'm wondering whether at some cumulative dose these released ions become toxic to humans, or is that dose also negligible? So uh, it's a little complicated question, but I think it's the cumulative effect that he is talking about rather than at a single uh, ion level. Yeah, so th this is a very important point too, but as far as um, 
metals that are metal ions that are likely to be present, uh, they go through a second filtration. What you are seeing is the product just after the water is exposed to materials. And now, in an industrial process, even if there is some tiny amount that is subsequently removed, and that is how water is released into the environment when you when you drink or use it. So this is one way of uh, safeguarding that. The other point is that even if that were to be released, uh, as far as silver is concerned, it doesn't bioaccumulate because there is a mechanism of removing that. But there is, let us say, if there is a bioaccumulation potential for such materials, toxicity has to be evaluated before the technology is applied into the field. So this is what we do. Uh, I only showed the first portion of it. These materials do not release ions. Now, if there is a background ion, I mean, nanoparticles, the background ion concentration result or is subsequently present in the filtered water. And if that background ion bioaccumulates, you have to do additional studies. Very good. Thanks, sir. I think that would address the question. Uh, Vineet Bakshi has asked a very practical question. Uh, whom do we contact for setting up a plant of 5,000 liters of water per day for a school in Kota, which uses tube well water unfit for drinking? Current, current commercial domestic RO plants are being used. I presume that's very expensive. So what one of your startups, I guess, would be the right... Yes, sure, sure. It all depends upon the input input concentration of uh, contaminants. So, if they are addressable, certainly yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Vineet, uh, I would uh, request you to uh, uh, to connect with uh, uh, perhaps may I suggest that he connects with you, sir, and then you can point yes, him to the right uh, company. Yes, I will uh, just respond to him uh, right now. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, third question on the chat is from Sridhar Sampat, uh, sir. How does your nano material purification technology compared with RO, conventional RO, I presume, for arsenic removal. So is there any benchmarking that was done? So at the top, the top of my head, conventional RO is, is electricity intensive, it is you know, waste material intensive, and I guess the purification rates are like one liter per uh, yeah. perhaps five or 10 liters of uh, uh, input what something of that nature correct that's my well, ro in a convention you know in a conventional ro uh, of course there is as anand said the in energy one important thing and there is a small is a significant waste uh, water is lost so here there is water loss is less than one percent it is used only for what sort of backwashing uh, otherwise, there is no water loss uh, per se. The overall uh, cost, as I said, 2.1 paisa per liter or 2 paisa per liter, it, it is impossible to, RO cannot beat that uh, today. So this is, uh, RO in Indian context, the larger problem is electricity. In rural village, uh, village drinking water supplies, we do supply, I mean, people have supplied RO purifiers. They work for two years. And this is where the problem is, then you have to change the filter, you have to change the pump, you have to have electricity is a serious problem. So this is where RO is suffering, but there are many places where RO is a great solution and it is important to be implemented. These material solutions may not address, let us say ionic concentration is more than 3000 ppm, these will not address that. Uh, so therefore RO is needed. As I said previously, many different ions like nitrate, uh, materials-based solutions are not the best. Uh, so RO is certainly needed. Excellent, sir. So thank you. Uh, the C. Subramaniam has a uh, hand up and then there is a question which has just come from Sri Ramakrishna. So uh, Subramaniam, can you go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good evening, sir. It's as usual, very fascinating work every time I hear it. It has been a huge source of inspiration, as always. Um, so I have a, a kind of a, not a very technical question, but I wanted to kind of uh, uh, get your uh, comments on, uh, say, for example, some, somebody, uh, for, for in order to achieve this scale of uh, science, technology, engineering, and real-time demonstration and contribution to the society, it's not enough um, uh, being a scientist alone, you have to be an engineer, you have to be an economist to do a lifetime uh, life cycle analysis, uh, environmentalist, and um, manpower handling, so many things. So 
uh, what is um, if you were to say, uh, put all this in one bucket and call it as an ecosystem what is the single single biggest uh, um, uh, support from the ecosystem that you think is valuable for several if somebody venturing into this direction for somebody uh, like what what should they expect from the ecosystem or what should the ecosystem um, try to give them very complex question <laughs> but uh, the the answer is to me it is people uh, and uh, to me i have been in a position to do this just because there are i mean it becomes emotional because uh, there are a few people in the institute system uh, which made it possible uh, for for us to stand up today if baskar was not there i'm i'm just sort of calling names here uh, we wouldn't have probably made it uh, this far if uh, ashok jindalwala was not there we wouldn't have made it this far of course we you know it is about individuals uh, all right of course uh, they also depend uh, on, on the other side they, they would say hey you know pradeep was there or something but point is that system is in a position to deliver its capacity when people are at the right place iit system has been great you know what it is because of its autonomy it, it, that great autonomy the second uh, uh, as i said is a people the, again the third is also people but students is is a great students and who have been in a position to take this but students are in a position to take this because of today's environment 10 years ago or 15 years ago if i were to say that i'll take this as a challenge and uh, make a plan or something the parents would have stopped them uh, but today's uh, your parents are saying well go ahead it's okay try uh, incubation is a possibility uh, a business challenge is a possibility instead of uh, let us say uh, microsoft or google or something take water as a challenge so society started believing in this so it's a mix of many things but i would say the first and foremost is people uh, and people who baskar once asked me how are you taking up all this challenge you say that somebody comes in a district collector or a minister comes and says hey can you supply water to this village for that uh, particular town You say it is possible. How do you take up this challenge? Uh, uh, look at it. Uh, you take up this challenge with all these uh, young kids. I once I told him. I mean, this uh, unofficial now. Anyway, you are recording. But uh, uh, what I told him was that Basker, you look at uh, San Jose. All of these have come up with our kids. precisely so therefore on them i am ready to bet yeah thank you thank you sir thank you excellent sir i think and that's where uh, the alumni on the call i think we can we can really help because it's giving you a different audience to have, you know talk about not just the challenges but also the opportunities and we will certainly do our bit to make sure that uh, you know we can convene this right mindset and the ecosystem so uh, we are at the end of the hour but uh, there are three or four questions on the chat uh, do you mind staying on for a few more minutes and addressing them yeah sure sure yeah i will so i'll just do them quickly uh, alamelu's question i think is uh, relatively straightforward are these solutions mainly for industrial or large scale or is it available for household level uh, household we have uh, implemented about 20000 filters in arsenic affected areas where pipe to water supply was not there and people wanted affordable solutions without electricity so uh, that's grouped down to the household level okay yeah. but we are not uh, there to uh, compete with ro uh, yeah then uh, b vishwanathan has asked a question uh, comment on solutions for disposal of filtered contaminants arsenic collected from backwash salts removed during ro process etc Uh, so as, as i said previously uh, these materials do take up when they take up arsenic they don't release this arsenic in the conditions <clears throat> when they are uh, disposed so th there is a methodology to evaluate such toxic materials release this is called toxicity characteristic leaching protocol uh, according to this you are sub, you are supposed to test every material Uh, whether they conform to that such standards 
we have such standards america has such standards we evaluate these uh, with such standards and our materials can go back to uh, uh, land uh, as a, san a safe land uh, disposal at a safe land disposal site <clears throat> so, so they bind it in that uh, in that yeah. sense and they just okay. right. uh, there is one more question from uh, uh, um, Sri Ram Krishnan, who's not asked a question before, xylem and graphene membranes have been suggested in the past decade as physical sieves. What are the opportunities to use them as scaffolds to add nanoparticles such as molybdenum sulfide that you shared? So I guess instead of the cellulose-based uh, scaffolding, he's suggesting xylem and graphene membranes. Absolutely, they are very much possible uh, to be used. One has to look at the cost, etc. So we have a range of such materials that we have produced uh, in this now in an industry of water uh, purification the first and the last question is always cost uh, and uh, what meets that price today if it is possible for us to make one 2.1 paisa to two paisa we would go for it hmm. economics i see uh, thomas piketty's book behind you so economic yeah, as sorry. important as science in any of these last question on the chat sir is again from vineet who had asked an earlier question is there any research underway for the development of nanomaterial uh, for sea water in naval ships and submarines yes there are uh, materials uh, in the context of let us say avoiding um, let us say uh, organisms fouling the surfaces uh, better re reducing resistance uh, on surfaces, um, corrosion resistance on, on that. So if you are asking in the context of water, clean water, capacity desalination can be looked at as a nanomaterials based solution. But as I said, seawater is a complex thing. At 35,000 ppm to 40,000 ppm, these materials based solutions do not produce drinking water, uh, that is a risk uh, there. That is where a combination of solutions are required. But water is not just seawater producing drinking water. A naval vessel has many other waters, and several of them uh, have nanomaterials-based solutions. We can uh, discuss offline. Excellent. Thank you, sir, uh, for that very, very uh, uh, enlightening lecture uh, from science to engineering to economics and then changing lives of humanity. Uh, on behalf of the Alumni Center and the webinar series, I'd like to thank you sincerely for this uh, wonderful talk. In, in, in a physical world, we would have taken you for dinner now, but uh, we can take that as the Americans say with a rain check. So, you know, next time you're at the center, we will definitely love to host you for, for a free lunch or a free dinner. Uh, thank you again for all the, uh, the the audience for being so patient. There are more than 30 people who have logged in, which is uh, very, very nice for a Saturday evening. And of course, it will be available online for people who miss it. Thank you once again, everyone. And thank you, Professor. Thank you, sir.